The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're talking with Stephen Moeller. He has been a licensed funeral director since 1978. Steve established one of the first grief recovery method support groups over 30 years ago. He spends the bulk of his working time focused on certification trainings for the Grief Recovery Institute and writing articles for their website. Today, we're discussing grief and we're referencing their book, The Grief Recovery Handbook. So, Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So how did you get involved with the Grief Recovery Institute? Well, as a funeral director, fairly early in my career, I really felt limited on what I could do with poor people to help them through that process in just the few days we had together. I mean, we could take care of the mechanics of handling a service of some kind, but there was so much more that seemed to be lacking. So I started actually hunting for for some kind of mechanism I could use to help people, uh, for better, lack of a better word, recover from the pain of their loss. And after checking a variety of resources, I came onto the Grief Recovery Institute, and what I liked about what they had to offer was it wasn't brain surgery. It was just helping people deal with the woulda, shoulda, couldas, the unfinished business and relationships so that they could enjoy memories without being overwhelmed by all the stuff they wished might have been different. And uh, what it worked for me amazingly. And when I found that it worked for me, I thought, okay, this is something I can tell other people about. And that was the genesis all those years ago. So uh, can you tell us exactly what grief is? Well, grief is the normal and natural emotional response to any change that occurs in your life. It's, it's the conflicting feelings caused by the end or, or change in a familiar behavior pattern. Sometimes, and you know, one of the best definitions I ever heard, and John James, the uh, founder of the Grief Recovery Institute, shared this one with me years ago. It's like reaching out for someone who's always been there, only to find when you need them one more time and really need them the most, they're gone. Hmm. So... What, um, are there, obviously there must be other times that we're grieving aside from, you know, someone dying and that kind of loss. What are oh. other situations people experience this? Yeah, really every major change in your life can have grief attached. I mean, it could be the death of a person or a pet, but it can be the breakup of a relationship or a divorce or even such things as graduating and leaving one school behind, going to another one. Uh, moving, uh, if something happens to your home, or a favorite possession is lost, all of those can be grief-generating events, basically any change from what's normal. Well, you know, one situation I can think of as well that I definitely had to go through with, um, I, I was sick for a long time with, with chronic Lyme, and I, I lost the ability to be who I wanted to be and yeah. who I had been, you know, and I, I know that, um, especially now with treating chronic Lyme, is one of the biggest things that people suffer with is they, they want things to be different than what they are. Oh, heavens yes, any chronic disease situation is a huge change from what you, what life was or what you expected life to be, and of course would have all kinds of grief attached to it. So what, what does it mean to recover from grief? 
Uh, recovery, you know, that's a word that scares some people because they think if I'm recovering, does that mean I'm forgetting? And people don't have delete buttons. We just don't forget things. But what we can learn to do is, for lack of, again, of a better word, thrive and survive in spite of them. It's about being able to enjoy fond memories without being overwhelmed by the unfinished business, the things we wish might have been different or better in that relationship. I often equate it a little bit to walking down the street and you see a beautiful flower garden. It reminds you of your mother. My mother loved flower gardens and planted them every year. And seeing that garden and thinking, oh, now that's a garden mom would have really loved. But I can't tell her about it because she died. And the last time she planted one, I I never told her how pretty it was. I just took it for granted and so on and so on. Grief hits us at weird times. We can see something that's a fond reminder of that person, but often very shortly thereafter we spiral down into those things we wished we could have said or should have said or should have done or could have done. All of those things are the things that are really generating grief, and to recover from loss is to be able to see those things and, again, enjoy the fond memories without being overwhelmed by all that unfinished business. So when when we lose someone, we'll use that more as, as the example, what are the common um, emotions or feelings that somebody's going through? Well, I'd see one of the biggest things that happens to grievers is a real reduced sense of concentration. They're easily distracted or easily confused. We have that, if it's in the moment a loss happens, we have that sense of numbness that overcomes us. And it can ultimately affect your sleep and make changes in how you eat. For instance, if it was a death and it was someone that you always uh, shared a meal with, eating like you used to isn't the same thing anymore so sometimes our eating habits change it's just a roller coaster of emotional energy that we encounter as a, as a result of that those are common responses so um, is there a, a certain order or stages that this happens um, not really <laughs> You know, over the years, a lot of people have talked about stages of grief or ways in which things happen, and there really are no stages to anything. Each person is different. Each relationship is different. So consequently, how you respond to one loss or one grieving circumstance may be entirely different than how you respond to another. It's so individual to that person. So... um yeah, I guess that was going to be my next question. Is there different ways that people grieve? Well, in the way we grieve, boy, that again is very individual. Some people find themselves getting upset over the silliest little things, or little things set them off, so to speak. Uh, other people just ha- lose an interest in doing things. They tend to isolate, and grief is very isolating. Uh, for other people... Um, they just shut themselves away from things. Again, that's part of that isolation. But how we respond, again, depends entirely on that individual loss. Sometimes we just have a sense that life isn't worth living anymore. And that might not be about a death. It could be about a job loss or anything else that really breaks our heart. Yeah. So when is the appropriate time to seek help when we're grieving? Well, you know, over the years, I've had a lot of people that were concerned that maybe they were looking for help too soon, and there really isn't a too soon to take action. As a funeral director, right in those moments after a death, when I was called to a home or a hospital when somebody died, I might in that moment start taking a little bit of action with them, asking them if there were things they just wish they could have shared or could have said to that person, and inviting them to put voice behind those things right in that moment. That's kind of an early step in the process. But when it comes to going through the complete recovery process or taking action for recovery, basically I think the biggest determinant is when they're ready to take action, when they want it to They want to be able to enjoy memories. They don't want to be the person they are becoming because um, they have to be ready to take steps in order to actually recover. No one can make you recover from a loss. It has to be a conscious choice on your part that you're not happy with how things are and you want to do something different. 
But as far as a time frame, there are some people, I've worked with a few people that within a matter of a day or two after the death, they were ready to actually take the full steps required to go through a recovery process. And other people that were so overwhelmed with the stuff they had to do in that moment that they needed a little bit of time to accomplish those things that had to be done before they could sit down and actually take action for themselves. But time isn't the factor. It's what you do with the time and when you're ready to do it. Um, so I know that one thing that you, you talk that gets talked about in the grief recovery handbook is um, that a lot of us aren't prepared for loss. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because we spend most of our lives learning how to get things, not learning how to let go of them. It's rare that somebody would ever have a, a parent say, sit them down on their knee in those formative years and say, uh, "Son, these are the things you need to learn to deal with loss." Most of us kind of learn those in the moment an event happens, and as a result of that, sometimes we end up getting information that really has no bearing on dealing with the emotional pain that we're dealing with in that moment. That's something that we sometimes refer to as misinformation. That's and, and so, so how, how does that happen? Is that just um, something that um, we're, we're just taught as we as we were going through life, or what's happening there? Well, I'd say not so much something that somebody sits down and actually tries teaching us, but children are amazing listeners. In fact, they listen sometimes at the times you don't want them to listen, so they hear what's going on. And I think back to the very first loss that I experienced. When I was four years old, uh, my best friend died. My best friend happened to have four legs, but still, it was my <laughs> best friend, our family dog. Yeah. And when I was crying and really upset about this, that's when I got some of that first misinformation on how to deal with loss. My parents told me, don't feel bad. On Saturday, we'll get you a new dog. And if I'd been really precocious, I would have said, why shouldn't I feel bad? My best friend left without so much as saying goodbye, and I'll never see her again. But at four years old, when a parent or somebody you trust tells you something, you try and live up to that. And so that's when I got those two bits of information. Don't feel bad and re get a new one. And that worked fine when I lost a toy truck or my bike fell apart. Don't feel bad, we'll get you a new one. But when grandma died, how do you get a new grandma? That's the tough <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. And then at the same time, you know, when, when grandma died, um, and my mom was a changed person after that. It was her mother who died. And she just emotionally shut down. And I remember asking my dad, when will mom be mom again? And his comment was, son, you just have to understand that grief just takes time. One of the worst bits of misinformation we tell people. All that happens with time is it goes by and you get used to living in that pain. But she does, it doesn't do anything for helping you to move beyond it. And quite frankly, my mom was never the same again until her Alzheimer's got to the point she forgot her mother died and then she was nice again. But that was 35 years later. That should have been enough time if time was a factor. But those are, are some examples of that kind of misinformation, that and telling people to be strong and to keep busy. Well, sitting in a chair staring at the wall doesn't help, but keeping busy just gives you another point of focus until you're not busy anymore, and that loss is still there for you. And being strong is another way of saying stuff your feelings. We don't want to hear them, which is what grievers tend to do when they follow that misinformation. They tend to internalize all that pain rather than share it with other people or to get it out of their system because they just don't know how. Every time they try and, and express what they're feeling, people give them reasons why they shouldn't feel that. And they're very logical, but grief is not a logical thing. It's emotional. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I think everybody can relate to what you're saying. We've all heard these things, probably had them told to us as we were growing up and going through life, um, you know, to avoid feeling those emotions and to, you know, be strong and, and all of those things. Um, and definitely you know, grief takes time is what I think we've we've all come to understand as as what we think is reality, but what you're saying is is different. Yeah, but I think that when you really sit down and think about it, 
the passage of time just gets you used to feeling the pain and living with it. It becomes your new normal. And it doesn't have to be your new normal. You can take action for yourself so that, like we go back and talk about what we talked about earlier, so that you can recover, so you can enjoy those fond memories without being overwhelmed. And, you know, after my grandmother died, I don't think my mom ever got to enjoy the positive things that her mother brought to her life because she was so focused on that moment of death that all the years before were totally lost because they were overwhelmed by that that one moment in a relationship, if you will, that one chapter from a very long book. Yeah. But that chapter now controlled her life. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Stephen Moeller. He works for the, um, the Grief Recovery Institute, and we're discussing their book, The Grief Recovery Handbook. So we'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Have you had a chance to check out Voice America's online magazine and blog, Press Pass? If you love our hosts and shows, check out articles that give an even deeper perspective. Plus, topics about health and fitness, movie reviews, philosophy, business tips and tactics, spirituality, positive thought, current events, and even more about your favorite host. It's just a click away at VAPressPass.com. That's VAPressPass.com. VA Press Pass by Voice America. All access, all the time. Tune in to the Voice America Variety Channel on the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Voice America Variety broadcasts a diverse array of topics, reaching a global community. Our experts come from all walks of life, and the topics they discuss are everything from current events, arts and entertainment, leadership, parenting, relationships, self-improvement, career advice, and a variety of other topics. Check us out today. You're sure to find something of interest. Voice America Variety. Talk on today's hot topics. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN, the Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Stephen Moeller. He is a licensed funeral director, and he um, focuses, most of, focuses most of his time on certification trainings for the Grief Recovery Institute. We're discussing their book today, the Grief Recovery Handbook, if you're looking for more information. So, Stephen, um, 
from from personal experience, one thing I know, and this kind of ties into what we were saying before the break, that that nobody really knows how to deal with grief. And I, I think that goes not only from the people who are experiencing it, but those that are around them. Um, you know, I've I've been through some losses, and the biggest thing was. Uh, people kind of disappeared. They were afraid to talk about it. You know, they just thought, oh, well, you were busy, so I didn't want to bother you. And and I I, I feel like that that um, is something that we need to talk about more so that people understand how they can help people that are going through that process. Exactly. I think that's a very important thing because whether we like it or not, so often the wrong things come out of our mouths without our even realizing it because they seem logical. They seem like a good idea. I mean, I never want my friends to be hurting after something, but telling them not to feel bad doesn't make them feel better. It just tells them, don't tell me that you're feeling bad. So it's finding the right things to say. And there there are a variety of things that we can say. Probably one of the best things to ask somebody after they've dealt with any loss experience, especially immediately thereafter, is ask them what happened. Invite them to be able to share that story because sometimes it's retelling that story that makes it more real for them. Don't press them if they say, oh, no, I'm not going to talk about that. Don't drill into them. Oh, no, you have to talk about it. But rather say it in a caring and loving way and, and tell them, you know, if I, if I don't know what happened exactly, say, you know, tell me what happened. And then you have to do something which is very difficult, and that is simply listen. You can't fix the problem. You can't go back and change time. You just have to listen without analysis, criticism, or judgment. You have to be comfortable using words that have emotion attached to them, like, oh, my goodness, that sounds devastating, or something like that. Because they need to understand that you're all right with matters emotional, that you're not afraid of emotion and trying to keep it just a clinical description because that's often what they'll offer simply because experience has taught them people really don't want to hear the emotional side. They just want the facts. And grief is emotional. It gets them a chance to share some of that. And say things like, I just can't imagine what you're going through. Can you tell me about it? In other words, it's not so much about our saying stuff, but inviting them to share, again, without analysis, criticism, or judgment, and recognizing whatever the problem is they're sharing, we can listen to them, we can support them, but we really can't fix it. We can't change time. We can't go back and bring that person back to life or stop that car accident from happening or whatever the situation was. We just have to be there for them to listen. Well, you know, I, 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 I like hearing that. I know when I lost my brother, I found actually people didn't want to listen. Uh, they found it difficult to hear it. And I was okay with talking about it, but um, most of the time I had to watch what I was talking about because people didn't want to hear it. Exactly. And there's, we did a study one time years ago at the Institute, and we found that after a, a loss event, 98% of the people that were impacted by that loss want to talk about what happened. And 95% of the people around them are avoiding the subject like the plague, thinking if I bring it up, it's just going to upset them. So it, it sounds like a really good question to ask just because they've told us this is what we want to share. This is retelling that story is important to us. Yeah, well, and it, it can help you feel like you have support as well, that there's people around you that are, are willing to listen and understand. Yeah. And at the same time, you want to be very careful that you don't try and compare it to your loss or say, well, you think your situation is bad. I went through something so much worse. Because then that just, it's like downplaying the importance of their loss. Don't, don't try and compare losses. You can share, gosh, I know what that was like when I went through something similar, but turn it back to them and invite them to share more of their story. Because nothing bothers, well, there are a lot of things that bother grievers, but one thing that really hurts to have people say is, I know how you feel. Because in reality, nobody knows how you feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember when I was 21, I had a little accident and broke and dislocated my neck. I obviously recovered from that. 
but um, I remember being in the hospital and traction and all kinds of things while they were trying to figure out how to keep my head from falling off of my shoulders. And a friend came in to see me, and he asked me what, what I was going through, and I thought, oh, that's so wonderful, I shared. And then he chased that with, I know just how you feel. I broke my finger once. <laughs> he was lucky I was uh, chained to the bed because I probably would have jumped up and throttled him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and it, it's hard to compare, you know, different journeys, different pain, because we're yeah, all experiencing it different. Yeah, it doesn't do anything to help you recover. It just, yeah. it just makes, it discounts your pain. And in that moment when you're expressing it, you don't need anybody to discount it. Yeah. So when when we're uh, talking about, you know, the unresolved grief, like your mother, for example, who um, really never dealt with it, was continuing to grieve for 35 years. How is that affecting most people if they're not dealing with it to let that go or resolve that unfinished business? I think it more often than not, it just simply takes away from their ability to experience joy. Grief is cumulative. Um, every new loss stirs up all those other losses that you have not effectively dealt with in terms of taking recovery action. So you're not only just grieving that experience, but everything else. And it tends to shut you down on an emotional level. You tend to withdraw from things. You're, you don't have the ability to form new relationships with people or things or whatever because there is that sense that you're going to lose them again that overwhelms you. And so those people tend to shut down a bit, uh, be a little more withdrawn, a little less outgoing, much more protective of who they are and the things that matter to them because nobody else seems to care. And so that becomes the thing they have to hang on to because if nobody else seems to care as much or be as impacted as much as they are, then it becomes, if you will, the cross they have to bear and carry. Yeah. Well, and and I've, I've heard comments similar to this, and I'll just give one example, but, you know, say the example of losing your dog, where the response would be not to replace it, but not to get one again because you, it's too hard when you lose it. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so not, well, what not often living happens, life, people, yeah. people will run out and get a new dog, but then they figure there's something wrong with this new dog because Fluffy 2 does not act like Fluffy 1 because yeah. they're two different dogs. And so that, uh, that disturbs that relationship. Surprisingly, there are a lot of, of pets that are purchased immediately after the death of one to replace another that end up being uh, abandoned or left to the pound because it's not the same, so therefore it's not right. They can't bond with that new, that new pet in the way they did with the old one. Well, and they probably weren't weren't ready to. Perhaps. Exactly, you yeah. can't effectively begin a new relationship until you've dealt with the unfinished business and the relationship lost. Yeah, so so that brings us to, of course, how can can we work on how can we recover? Well, recover involves taking personal action, and that is that is the hard part when you recognize that that being this way is not what you want to be anymore. You need to find some way to recover from that loss. Now, I am one of those people that is a big do-it-yourselfer. I mean, I reblocked the foundation wall of my house one time by myself. I thought it would be a weekend project. took three weeks. But by the same token, grief recovery is not a do-it-yourself project. You need to have someone to be physically present with you in this process, to be able to hear the things that you need to express of an emotional nature or anything else. You need direction and guidance because it's not just about talking. There are, there are lots of support groups out there, and some support groups are amazing, but a lot of times those support groups just support you in continuing to feel your pain. You need an action plan that starts at the beginning of, why am I not feeling better by now? I think I should, or all my friends tell me I should be doing better, to a point at the end where you can enjoy those memories and everything else. And Of course, I'm a little biased, but I'm in all the years of hunting, and believe me, I, I still hunt to this day. I haven't found an action plan that seems to work better than the one that's offered through the Grief Recovery Handbook. 
because it's very much a step-by-step process, starting in the beginning with all that, those feelings of emotional pain and loss and moving to a point at the end where you can enjoy fond memories without being so overwhelmed by the fact that perhaps you can't create more fond memories with that person. Well, you know, and it, it, it seems important to, to talk about how we can find the right person to help us if we're doing this with oh, somebody. Oh, heavens, yes. Yeah. Because that, that is the key to anything. Um, on our website at uh, griefrecoverymethod.com, you can actually search for somebody who is a grief recovery specialist in your area. That would be somebody that is trained, and that's what I do. I train people to do this kind of work to help grievers walk through this journey. But even if that isn't possible for one reason or another, because I'd love to say they're everywhere in the world, and by golly, we have people on every continent except Antarctica, and there just doesn't seem to be a huge demand down there to have a specialist located there. The Grief Recovery Handbook itself recognizes some people are going to pick this book off the shelf. They don't have a resource person with them right there to work with. And so the last three pages of Chapter 6 and all of Chapter 7 are devoted to figuring out how to find a partner to work with, setting up the guidelines for making this work in such a way that you both benefit from this and one person doesn't overwhelm the other. Well, you know, and in the descriptions, it was pretty clear what what the role of of the listener was. You know, don't talk and actually just listen. Exactly. Don't compete. You know, yeah, and uh, uh, which I think is important because what is probably needed the most is somebody to listen. Exactly, and that was that was a real hard thing for me at first because I grew up in the '60s, and in the '60s everybody hugged and supported everybody else, or at least that's that's the popular image of the '60s. I'm not sure it was always that way, but it sure sounds good now to say it that way. And for me to just sit and listen and not try to fix that was that was a little challenge at first when I got started with this, and knowing that. Sometimes when they're sharing something emotional, you don't even reach over and touch them and hug them because that pulls them to the reality of, oh, I'm here right now and I'm sharing something emotional and I've been raised my whole life and I'm supposed to keep those emotions boxed inside. So there is good instruction in that, but if you can find somebody who is a trained specialist, that always works better. And we even have uh, two-day personal workshops where you can consolidate what normally would be covered in eight meetings into a a very intensive two-day period. If you're in the position you can travel and take one of those workshops, that can be a big boon in and of itself as well. So how how does this process start? Boy, that's now now you've asked the sixty four thousand dollar <laughs> question. Now I'm showing my age again by quoting a game show from way before I was born. <laughs> but uh, it involves first of all deciding, yes, I'm ready to take some action. It means either finding a group in your area or a specialist that will work with you one on one. I favor groups personally simply because if grief is very isolating and it is part of that is because you don't realize how many other people are out there hurting so often we we tend as grievers we have a tendency to start to lie to other people not nasty lies but they ask us how we're doing and we we learn pretty quickly that they always respond better if we say fine instead of telling them the truth so if you're in a group situation you discover oh my god i'm not the only person grieving there are lots of grievers out there I think that in and of itself is a wonderful thing. If you can't find a group or a situation like that, then it's going out and buying that book and following clearly what's laid out when it comes to finding a partner with whom to work. Then we're going to be taking a step-by-step process of figuring out, first of all, what loss do we need to work on first? Because that most recent one literally may be the straw that broke the camel's back that internal kettle inside you where you've been stuffing all these feelings related to all these different losses may have finally reached the point where the most recent loss just tipped you over the edge and said, I've got to do something. So we help people search to find, is that the loss where we start? Or is there another loss there that is so overwhelming that that set the stage for everything that we've done hereafter? 
And then we look into that relationship and actually do a little visual inventory of that relationship, plotting out all the highs and lows in that relationship because those are the things that usually have unfinished business attached. Things that if we could sit that person down in front of us, and again, we're talking about relationships with human beings, but quite frankly, it could be with your dog or it could be with your house. If you can sit whatever that is down in front of you and just talk to them and have them listen, what, what's unfinished? What, what things do you wish you could just apologize for? Or you need to forgive them for, or more important, what do you want to say from your heart concerning each one of these little instances in your life? We used to refer to those as Kodak moments, but I've discovered that with time and the fact that people don't use film anymore, most people don't know what a Kodak moment is. <laughs> but uh, that was meant to be those little snapshots from your life that have a lot of emotional energy attached. And those are usually the things that get in the way from your being able to enjoy memories. It's uh, that unfinished business. And we take a few more steps in the process, but in the end, it's about being able to say goodbye to what's unfinished, goodbye to those unmet dreams and expectations, uh, goodbye to a future that's different than the one I'd planned on, or goodbye, I guess really it's goodbye to what I planned on because my future is going to be different, and being able to move forward and and enjoy those memories again. And over the uh, my career, being in funeral service, I ran groups for over 30 years. And to see that change happen with people, when they first came in and they were just so overwhelmed, they could barely say the person's name or the pet's name or, or whatever it was that they had lost, to the point at the end where they're out there telling stories about them and laughing and enjoying it, to me that told me, oh, by golly, this really works. <clears throat> <laughs> that you know um, that that sounds amazing. Uh, I want to talk more about it when we come back. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Stephen Moeller, and we're discussing uh, the book, The Grief Recovery Handbook. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. Have you become a member yet? Sign up now to become a member of Voice America. It's always free and easy. Plus, you get to take advantage of some great member benefits. Get unlimited access to millions of hours of on-demand content across all of our channels. Keep track of your favorite episodes, shows, and hosts in your own customizable library. Find out what shows you might be interested in based on your favorites. Plus, you get insider access with our newsletter. Membership gives you more. Sign up at voiceamerica.com and click register at the top right. These days, everyone is looking for information on staying young, healthy, and fit. The Voice America Health and Wellness Network is here to help you on your quest to better health and a better you. We talk about everything from diet, fitness, and aging to substance abuse, personal growth, mental health, and much more. Learn from our experts who cover health and wellness from traditional and holistic perspectives. Tune in to the Voice America Health and Wellness Network. Healthy living starts here. If you think you've seen online TV before, let us surprise you. VoiceAmerica.tv is online now. The leader in live Internet talk radio has done it again. Multiple channels, a state-of-the-art viewing experience, live and on-demand programs streaming 24 hours a day. It's exactly what you want, when you want it. VoiceAmerica.tv. From health and wellness to business, sports, and everything in between. Discover our new world. Visit VoiceAmerica.tv now and experience the future of online television. VoiceAmerica.tv. Now you can take your favorite Voice America radio program with you anywhere. Sign up for our mobile app if you have an iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. The Voice America interactive radio player, powered by Aircast, gives you the freedom to listen to any of our programs anywhere, live, and on demand. No registration is required. Listen to your favorite Voice America hosts and discover new ones. Download the Voice America mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry, powered by Aircast. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness.
You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks, everybody. Today we're talking with Stephen Moeller. He is, um, he uh, focuses on certification training for the Grief Recovery Institute. And today we're discussing uh, their handbook, the Grief Recovery Handbook. So Stephen, um, before the break, we talked about the process in the handbook of uh, recovering from grief. And, um, you know, it sounds pretty amazing. And I, I think a lot of people listening, um, especially if they've experienced grief, um, you know, it might even seem like it's not Too that good to simple. be true. Too good to be true, yeah, because it, you know, grief is so overwhelming, so um, uh, you, you must hear that, obviously, because you know where I was going with that. Yeah, I, I kind of had a clue because, you know, now my focus is primarily on training other people, but I spent um, well over 30 years actually working with grievers in group situations, and so... I've gotten to see so many people take this action and to be a part of that process of walking with them through that that valley of misery to the point at the end where they could enjoy memories again. And that's been a, a truly amazing experience because it just reinforced in me that, by golly, this does work. It may sound so easy. You know, my wife actually went through this training as well. And because she wanted to know what I was doing all those days at, or evenings at work when I was running groups. And she, the loss that she dealt with happened to be her relationship with her first husband. And afterwards she said, I said, how was it? And she said to me, it's like voodoo. And I said, <laughs> voodoo? It's not related to voodoo at all. No, she said, what, what I mean by that is it's not that involved a process. I mean, it's not like years of therapy. It's really a very relatively fast step-by-step process, but it works. It's too simple. It shouldn't work that well, but it isn't, it isn't about trying to fix reverse heads because they don't have broken heads. They have broken hearts. So the whole program is very heart-focused because grief is an emotion that touches our hearts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, in in the handbook, uh, and you touched on this a little bit, explaining what the process is, but um, uh-huh. what's a loss history graph? A loss history graph is a visual inventory of the losses we've experienced in life. When I was talking about trying to figure out which loss to work on first, it's looking at all those losses that have impacted us. And for instance, when I did my graph, it started with my my best friend, our pet that died. It included the death of my grandmother, a lot of other relatives. It included my broken neck. It included uh, moving from one place to another, uh, changes in schools, all those things that were had grief attached to them. And what I was trying to do in looking at that graph is figure out which one of these lines on this graph, if you will, is the one that impacted me the most on an emotional level and had the most, um, if you will, long-lasting negative energy, sadness attached to it. And that's where I started, but then after I finished successfully moving through that relationship to a point of recovery, now I had a record of all those other losses that impacted me. And what I found with this program, too, which I think is is a nice thing, it's not just about grief related to a major change, but it also can deal with ongoing relationships. You can have an amazing ongoing relationship, but it might have, like, for lack of a better word, like a little pebble in the shoe that sometimes gets a little irritating. And you can use this process to work through, figure that out, take the actions you need to take for yourself on that so that that doesn't become an ongoing irritant that turns into a big rock in the shoe. And uh, I think that's that's one of the positive things out of this. It's not about just dealing with loss, but it can help you take really wonderful ongoing relationships and make them even better. 
I've done the graph with my wife, and my wife and I have what I consider a pretty darn perfect relationship. The biggest argument we ever had was right after we got married, and that was how to have a pair of my pants. And she says, that's not an argument. I said, find a bigger one. But I've used this this process and this work to make sure that any little things that ever bothered me didn't turn into major obstacles in the joy of our marriage. Well, you know, and and uh, that that makes sense to me, especially when we're talking about how people are having trouble with grief because of misinformation that they were given about their emotions. It it you know those things don't necessarily affect us just with grief, right? If we're supposed to, you know, tough it out and always smile, we're not going to be acknowledging any other emotions either. Exactly. Exactly. We yeah. tend to. We tend to become really good at suppressing everything and keeping it stuffed inside. And uh, not talking about it doesn't do anything to solve the problem. It just makes the problem worse sometimes because then you overanalyze it internally as opposed to dealing with it. And yeah. um, why let, life's too short. I'm a firm believer. You need to enjoy every moment that happens because you're never guaranteed another one. So I like to be complete and in good shape with all of my ongoing relationships because I don't want to be left carrying that bag of grief if something should happen to somebody that I'm really close to. I want to make sure I tell them the things that are important instead of waiting until they're gone and discovering. I have a whole bag full of things I wish I talked about with them. Well, that that makes sense to me to 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 make sure that our relationships are positive in the way that we want them. Because um, in the book, you, it, it talks about incompleteness, which I think is um, what you're trying to avoid. But can you just explain what that is? Uh, it's about well, as I said, unfinished business. It's about those things that those conversations we never quite complete. You know, we always know there's tomorrow, we can talk about that and deal with it, but everything gets back burner to the point that suddenly there is no opportunity to share it. It's about things that we wish to been or wish could be different, better, or more in a relationship. Um, It would be wonderful if every relationship was exactly perfect, but I hate to say this, life could get a little boring if there wasn't some difference between myself and the next person that I'm talking to. We we wouldn't have anything to talk about because we'd know everything. Everybody is different. All of our relationships are unique, whether it's with our, our home or our car or somebody that we love deeply or our pet or anything like that. So it's completeness is about dealing with all of those things that we wish could be slightly different or slightly better, sometimes majorly different or majorly better, or had more opportunity to enjoy. And that is, that's about becoming emotionally complete. It's dealing with the unfinished business. So um, can you give us an example? I, I mean, I can imagine you've, you've seen hundreds of people go through this process. And, uh, you know, this is the too good to be true part. <laughs> where, <laughs> what is exa- exactly happening to people when they're going through the workshops or this process? Well, I, I'd say most people have their aha moment somewhere along the way where things start to fall into place. Over the years, because of the groups I've run, the multiple groups, I'm literally into the thousands of people I've worked with, which is one of the greatest gifts there is to me because I I just love giving people a chance to enjoy life more. I, it's, it's just part of who I am. And I can go back to uh, uh, the very first group I had when I was first learning how to present this to other people effectively. Somebody giving me instructions, but it's another thing when you're standing in front of people. And one of the people in that group uh, had driven 50 miles to come to the group, which I was overwhelmed with at first anyway. And he just sat in a corner in his chair in a fetal position. And what we finally got out of him was he had only been married a couple of years. His wife had just had a baby. And he came home one day, and she was dead on the kitchen floor, and that baby was just kind of crawling on her. It's almost like a scene out of Steel Magnolias, the movie. And uh, he was just, he was a basket case. He was pretty much non-functional. 
But he decided he was going to come to this because it's the only thing he'd heard about anywhere that might help. And he came every week. And we get to the point, let's skip ahead now to, to graduation, the last class together. And we had a potluck dinner to kind of give everybody a chance to wind down. And he brought his wedding album and his baby was showing pictures from the wedding album, telling a funny story about each picture, playing with his baby, talking about how much she looked like his wife and how he was going to enjoy sharing all these wonderful stories of what her mother was like in her life with that baby. To go from a fetal position where you couldn't even mention your wife's name without falling apart to the point where you're laughing and telling stories. To me, that was, that was kind of proof positive in that very first group that, that this would work. And I've seen that repeated so, so many times since that um, it's, it's a joy. And the funny thing is I, I go places and I have these people that come up to me and say, oh, you don't remember me, but I was in your group 10 years ago and you saved my life. My wife's taught me when they say that to say, thank you. And then I say what I always said before, which was, if you really want to see who saved your life, look in the mirror, because you're the one that took the action for yourself. All I did was, all I was was your guide. You were the one that did all the work. And uh, that goes on all the time. Uh, I've been in air, airports in other parts of the country and run into people that had gone through my group from years before. So it's, it's, um, it happens everywhere. Well, you know, um, I, what you say about that, about, you know, they're the ones that do the work, I think is um, applies to any part of our lives where, exactly. you know, we're the ones making the decisions for anything, you know, um, we're responsible for everything, even if we're responsible for taking the advice of a doctor or, um, you know, making the decisions to do certain things or not to do them, it's it's ours to do that with and to live as fully as we can. And so thank you for helping so many people to do that. Well, it's, it's getting them to understand that they're the, ultimately the one that's responsible for taking action for them. And we live in a society today where we're constantly taught to make other people responsible for our happiness or our unhappiness. You can turn on the TV at any hour of the day or night and find a lawyer telling you, that uh, if you did this or that, you can sue because it's their fault that you're unhappy today. And I'm not picking on lawyers because you can find that in all kinds of different contexts. But uh, ultimately, it's our responsibility to take action for ourselves. If I made my grandmother uh, totally responsible for the misery I felt after she died because of the changes of my mother, my only hope for getting better would be for Grandma to come back from the dead. And while I believe in miracles, what makes a miracle a miracle is it doesn't happen that often, and I knew Grandma was not coming back. That meant I had to realize that I had to take a little responsibility for how I was responding to her death and find a better way to deal with that unfinished business than what I was doing before so that I can enjoy memories of Grandma again as opposed to being overwhelmed with the pain that came when she died. Exactly. That was just a moment in our yeah. lifetime together. Yeah. So if there's anybody listening who um, is wanting more information, how can they do so? Well, there are two easy ways to do that. One of them is to go online. And gosh knows we all use the computer nowadays to find most things. And they can go to Grief Recovery Method all one word, dot com, C-O-M, and that takes them to the website where it talks about uh, what we do and the books and everything else because we have a variety of books, including ones on tent loss, ones on relationships lost as opposed to strictly the grief recovery handbook, or they can call, and that number is one 800 334 7606. Okay, well, Stephen, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. This was a great episode. I just had a wonderful time talking with you. As I, as I mentioned in the breaks, 
Uh, I could talk about this for days on end, but uh, your show doesn't last that long. <laughs> no, no. Unfortunately, I only get an hour, and sometimes I feel the same way. Um, so, we're uh, if anybody needs any more information, um, to definitely reach out, contact you, or get the handbook, which um, is very easy to read and follow. Um, so, it, it again, reads well, and you can get it in yeah. any bookstore or online. That's perfect. So we were talking today with Stephen Moeller, and we were discussing the book, The Grief Recovery Handbook, that is put out by the Grief Recovery Institute. So I want to thank everybody for uh, listening today, and just be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect.